Hey, welcome to AOE Live, episode number three, entitled Why Art is the Most Important Class and How to Spread the Word. Uh, we're recording this show live on Tuesday, March 24th. We'll be talking tonight about how art gives students the edge to succeed in life and how we as teachers can better promote that message and spread the good word. I'm Tim Bogatz, a 9th through 12th grade uh, high school art teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. And I am Andrew McCormick. I'm an 8th and 9th grade art teacher in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And I just got done with parent-teacher conferences, so hopefully I'm not too uh, slap-happy or loopy. Um, joining us tonight to talk about the importance of art and how we promote it is our guest, Lisa Phillips of The Artistic Edge. Um, Lisa is a talented author, blogger, journalist, speaker, mentor, business owner. That's a long list. Mm -hmm. uh, she currently lives in Toronto, Canada, um, and has about 16 years' experience as an arts and leadership educator. Um, her passion for helping people achieve success in, art, in, in all aspects of life really inspired her to publish her first book, The Artistic Edge, Seven Skills Children Need to Succeed in an Ever-Increasing Right Brain World. Um, Lisa, thanks for joining us. I know sometimes it's hard to totally give uh, people a sense of someone in a little blurb, so anything you'd like to add before we get going? Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. It's uh, amazing to chat with both of you guys about such an important topic. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've always been involved with the arts and have a career of almost 20 years now working with kids in, uh, in the arts and in leadership. So uh, the book sort of uh, spun out uh, kind of rather interestingly uh, where I was working as a camp director and really had the opportunity to um, see kids and what they were doing in terms of applying for summer jobs. And I realized there was a very interesting gap in their preparedness for the working world. And I saw a lot of the stuff we were doing at camp, uh, you know, arts camp, doing all the, all the arts programming, music, dance, theater, and visual arts, of course. And uh, I just saw this connection and uh, really inspired me to write a book about it. So the Artistic Edge is for educators, it's for parents, it's for any sort of adult who's passionate about arts education and how it uh, affects kids' ability to develop key leadership skills that they need to be successful later in life. Okay, very cool, very cool. Um, so for those of you in the audience who are joining us for the first time, uh, we want to tell you that our podcast really aims to dig a little bit deeper on a lot of the topics that we cover. So we'll be asking a lot of questions that will hopefully lead to a pretty good discussion tonight about all the different skills that the arts teach. And we'd love to hear your questions as well. Yeah, so join in, uh, participate. Um, you can talk to us in the chat on the AOE Live page. Um, ask us a question. Ask uh, Lisa a question. Um, get on Twitter, hashtag AOE Live. Um, kind of during some of the questions, we'll also look through the chat roll and see if any uh, if there's some questions we want to address live as we're talking. And as always, once we're done tonight, uh, uh, the podcast will be available on the AOE Live page and it'll go this week on iTunes. Uh, you can listen to it on your drive to school, at home in the evening, or even during your plan time. So Andrew, you want to uh, hit us with our three big topics for the evening? Yep, so we want to talk about, um, you know, A, uh, why, is art, why is art the most important class? Um, B, why isn't this a commonly held belief? And maybe we'll get, even get into the fact, is it a widely held belief? Um, my hunch is it's not, and we can kind of talk about why that isn't. Um, and then C, uh, what are some things that we as teachers can do to help spread this important message? All right. And, you know, as we're going through those topics, like we said, we'd love to hear your questions for Lisa. And so whether you're on the chat roll or on Twitter, uh, you know, hit us up. What, what do you guys want to know? Um, but I'll start it out. Uh, Lisa, when I was reading your book, uh, I noticed a lot of your thoughts about uh, the arts being almost an ideal vehicle for a successful 21st century education. So mm -hmm. can you talk specifically, I guess, about what skills students can learn through the arts that kind of go beyond what most people might think? Sure. Uh, wow, there are so many. <laughs> um, in my book, I focus on seven specific skills. So I talk about creativity, of course, as being the first one. Yeah. Uh, I talk about confidence, 
uh, which is so key in young people being able to sort of sell themselves, you know, whether they're going for a job interview or whatever it is. If you're not confident in yourself, you're really, uh, you're limiting your abilities uh, in, in what you're able to achieve. Um, problem solving skills is a big one, and I always say that all of our making is about problem solving and figuring out how are you going to create something from nothing, and it's actually a problem that the artist has to solve. Uh, right. So that's a big one. And also dreaming big. You know, a lot of um, a lot of people sort of, you know, can tend to sort of like, you know, what am I trying to say? Um, take the arts and go, oh, it doesn't matter, or it's just not a big deal. But if you actually don't have that ability to dream and think up new things, you're never going to have innovation. So a lot of art make, all of art making, all of creativity really stems from that bigger idea of how do you dream something up. So I think that's really a really, really key one uh, for sure. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about the arts and all art forms is it teaches accountability. And that might be one that's not always front of mind for people. Yeah. Um, if you take even, for example, um, the discipline of having to finish an art piece by a certain deadline, especially if you're even a professional artist and you've been commissioned to, you know, create a piece, you know, you have to have that accountability. If you're, you know, a musician, especially when you're doing ensemble-based work, you have that accountability to the ensemble that you're playing with or if it's, you know, a, a you're in a cast of a show, you know, and it's it's a different level of if you sort of look at it from that viewpoint, you can really um, get a. They're learning so many skills that just uh, if you don't have them as an adult, you would just will not succeed. Um, and I think the key, you know, there's also things like communication skills, which is you know all art is communicating some kind of a message. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and being adaptable, and I think that's probably one of the main things, is that in the 21st century, uh, things are changing so rapidly, and if you can't adapt to what's going on around you, you're going to get stuck. So, I mean, those are the seven from my book. There's so many others, whether it's perseverance or being able to show dedication to things. There's lots. It's just, uh, it's endless. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Um, and then I was just looking at the chat roll, and Kristen McCarthy had uh, a good little quip on there. She said that a student told me today that there should be a creativity class. And, yeah. you know, it's one of those things, like, why aren't people making those connections? And I think that kind of touches on a larger point that, that Andrew spoke about, uh, you know, as far as the sort of broad opinion of the arts. Okay. So I guess I'll direct this to you, Lisa. Um, how do you think students and parents kind of think of art education? Like, how do they perceive what we do? That's a great question, and I think it depends on who you're talking to. I mean, I think there's a, a group of educators and parents uh, that are very passionate and really see the value in it and see the sort of bigger picture benefit. I also think there's a probably a larger majority that just think it's not necessarily... Um, what's going to give their kids a competitive edge mm -hmm. and they're focused a lot I think on you know whether it's math or science or those types of, of classes which of course are important all of all of the disciplines are yeah, um, but my focus is very much on you know it's that artistic edge it's the creative edge that is just differentiating um, anybody who walks into the job for uh, walks into a door for a job interview, it's just very, very different when you see someone that has that creative ability. Yeah, very cool. If if I can interject on this point, you know, I I agree that oftentimes I think there is this perception that the arts arts are silly, frilly, fluffy, foo foo. But I I also think that that perception is if we allow that to be there, I think. Sometimes we think that that is the perception, mm -hmm. but we haven't really investigated whether that is the perception or not. We, we've heard that that's what the parents and the community think or the school board think, but until we really dig down deep and talk to parents, talk to school boards, you might have a much more favorable, rigorous opinion of the arts in your community than you even think. So some of that's like, you know, don't buy the hype that, that 
everyone's kind of thinking that we're all silly, you know. So and it, and it is what we make of it. If we can really promote the program, we start to defeat that uh, opinion, you know. For sure, and I think a lot of um, a, a lot of that sort of comes from you know seeing arts programming being cut, and I think you know cuts to arts education. You know, we've had you know many many years of it. Um, so I think I think part of that perception uh, is is through actions like that, where you know it's seen as not as important. Um, but I think, you know, Andrew, you're totally right. I think that there's, you know, there's probably, you know, pockets out there where there's so much uh, passion for it and so much uh, people who see the value in it, and we need to actually reach out and find those people so we can communicate more with each other. You know, you brought up something that people say it's not there's this negative perception that it's not important or it doesn't prepare our kids for this thing. And it's kind of ridiculous because it's like we can't predict what five years, ten years is going to look like. Do you think, Lisa, that some of that gets back to people's expectations for their kids in the future and what it holds? And we almost need to start attacking that and showing that the arts does a great job of preparing kids for that flexibility, that uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I find interesting and, in, you know, when I speak to educators or even parents is that there's not as, everybody has this sort of, um, this knowingness, I guess, that the arts develop these skills, but we don't really talk about it very much. And I think that's one of the key things, just to address your point, is that there's not enough discussion about what exactly are you teaching. Because yes, you're teaching shading or you're teaching perspective or whatever it is you're teaching in your art class, but there's a whole other layer to what is going on that doesn't get talked about as much. And it's those skills that you know I focus on in my book and that really uh, are what are setting up kids for success. And I think when educators can highlight that more in the classroom, the kids will get more out of the art programs and the parents and the school boards and you know the powers that be will actually start to see oh wait a minute there's a higher level of benefit that maybe we didn't fully realize or know how to communicate about it yeah and if I can toss something out there I guess um, I'll, I'll send this at both of you but uh, for those of you know that John Post uh, he mentioned on Twitter last night that your best advocate is, you know, the kids at home at the dinner table talking about what they did in art class. Mm -hmm. okay? But my thought is, you know, do those kids see or do they realize the bigger picture? Like, you know, they're talking about the shading, the perspective, whatever else you're teaching them, but are they seeing the bigger picture of what we're trying to do and can they explain that to parents? So, Andrew, what do you think about that? Well, man, that is a really interesting question because, you know, as you're asking that, I'm thinking back to the last four hours that I just spent with, with um, parents, and I had a number of comments um, from parents telling me, you know, my, my son, my daughter really enjoys this class. They're getting so much out of it. And I even had a conversation where it was, you know, I never thought my kid was into art or that artistic, and you're showing them a different side of what it means to be creative. And I was like, can I just audio record you right now and then like loop that later? Because that's, that's kind of why I'm in this field is like everyone can benefit from creativity. Now, now, specifically though, Tim, to your point, you know, specifically, I don't know, right? Like sometimes I think some kids can really articulate, well, mom, dad, we learned about uh, shading today, but really what Mr. McCormick wanted us to learn was how to be pre flexible, adaptable, be productive, and have accountability. Right. I don't know that there's a ton of kids that articulate it all that succinctly or that well. So I think that that still falls on us more than the kids. I mean, yeah, we got to get the kids jazzed and excited and, and have a good program and the kids promote the programs. But then I think, you know, when we get with parents, adults, that's when we can kind of say like, okay, I'm teaching this, but then there's a whole other level of skills that are being transferred and dare I say, being transferred better than in any other class in the building. Yeah. Okay, and so, Lisa, if I can direct this to you now. Um, 
as far as those big picture skills and getting kids involved and all that, uh, you know, if we look at that through the lens of like arts integration, for example, mm -hmm. do you think that arts integration does more to bring about respect for the art program, or would that be more of a you know uh, a dismissive like, oh, it's just kind of an add-on? Like, where do you fall on that? What do you think about that in regards to arts integration? Uh, that's a good question. I mean. I think um, I think arts is a natural fit into so many other subjects. So anytime you can right. include creativity and the arts into into other things, I think it's positive. You know, um, I think it obviously depends on on the school and and their approach to it. Um, but I think it's yeah. good. I don't think I don't think it should take away from the need to have dedicated arts classes where they are specifically learning about art or theater or dance or music, you know, and I think that if arts integration is going to detract from, oh, well, we're doing it in history class, so we don't really need to have, you know, music, a dedicated music ensemble, for example, then I'm not okay with that. If that yeah. sort of answers your question. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. Well, and, and that's kind of a double-edged sword, the notion of integration. Like, I love integrating other subjects into what I do because I think that's how the world works, right? There isn't, this is history, this is math, this is art. But if the arts is always the only program doing it in the building, right, and we're always asked, art teacher, how can you support what we are doing? We, I think, in a lot of people's mind, become a, a second fiddle. I want to teach in a yep. building where the math teachers are asked, math teachers, what are you doing that promotes creativity and critical thought and, 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 and the art skills? Or, or science teacher, what are you doing that? Now, now, some of that might be, you know, a pipe dream, but that's, that's equal footing if, if they're being approached that way. Yeah. So... Lisa, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about um, something that, you know, I talked briefly with you just yesterday, and something that really kind of blew me away that um, you touched on at the beginning is how the arts can promote leadership. You know, w we talk at length about how the arts and creativity go hand in hand. I've, I've never heard anyone talk about how the arts and leadership go hand in hand, and I think that's something that we might not always think about. So can you... Tell us more about what that looks like at the ground level. Like, how do how how does the arts teach those leadership skills? Sure. Uh, well, I think it really starts from the educator uh, being intentional about what they're teaching. So, you know, whether whether it's communication skills, whether it's uh, confidence, all those aspects, all those skills that I sort of listed off in my book are all examples of whether you're calling them leadership skills, life skills, there's things that, that, you know, when demonstrated, you notice them. You notice when someone is a master communicator. You pick up on it. You pick up on the fact that someone walks into the room with a, a huge level of confidence. So these are all things that when you put them all together, you have this incredible person who can conquer anything and can face anything that sort of hits them. So I think um, I think it's it's really about uh, it really starts with the educator in a lot of ways and deciding you know what is it that you know I'm teaching in this specific lesson that is teaching some kind of a leadership skill and deciding what it is and I think I think that's uh, what I would love to see more educators doing because that's where it'll start to come out more in their lessons or even debriefing their lessons. So it's a lot of, a lot of you know, what are those skills? Because there are so many in all forms of art. And I think it's about identifying them. And then if you discuss it with the students that you're working with, you really have the opportunity for them to develop even further through that, that process. Well, and I know that you reference those leadership skills in, in your article about the 10 skills that arts teach and also your book. Um, I have a, kind of an unusual question re related to that. You know, Tim's a high school art teacher. I'm a middle school art teacher. We, we've had guests on that are elementary art teachers. Do you think that leadership uh, skills are being taught and transferred at all levels? 
Is there a, an age where you feel like it really starts to click? Um, maybe talk a little bit about how that looks at the different age ranges. Sure. Well, I mean, I think it's a gradient scale. You know, I think depending on the age of, of the child or, or teenager, you're going to focus on different areas. But I think, you know, I think you can do it at any age. So I think it's about finding about what's age appropriate for that, you know, specific, uh, specific, you know, age bracket. Um, I think obviously you can get into more in-depth debrief conversations at a high school level where you're really delving into, okay, what is this piece communicating? And you're getting into that discussion. Or, you know, why did we do this? You know, what was the purpose? How does this... You know, how does this skill relate to you, know, you getting a job in five years after you're done university? You know, so at the high school level, maybe you can be having more conversations like that as part of a debrief, whereas when you're in grade three, maybe not so much. Right. Yeah. Uh, but there's, so it's, it's, it's really just the gradient, and I think educators need to sort of play with that. I think, but I, you know, I think it's a lot of, it's just starting to have the conversation with the students. You know, so, you know, first being intentional of, okay, what is the skill I'm actually teaching? And, you know, or what is the need within the school or in that class? If you're finding that a lot of your students are, have maybe demonstrating low self-esteem or, or they're shy, they're not as confident, okay, so you want to develop, you know, some kind of programming related to increasing their confidence. Okay, great. How can you do that? Pick a lesson and infuse that in, and then actually get the students to start talking about it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm kind of, I, you know, we talk about being deliberate, intentional. Um, I, so some strategies to do that. You know, we've kind of talked about getting the kids to share it when we talk and promote it with adults. Do you have some recommendations that public art teachers could do right now to really promote that message, you know, deliberately? Does it all boil down to communication, how we talk about it with our, our students and our parents, or are there some other things that we can do as well? Uh, well, I mean, I think I think it, it is a lot of it is communication for sure. Uh, a lot of it is, and I think sharing successes. I think uh, the more uh, art teachers can be online, can be sharing, you know. Uh, feedback from their students, sharing art pieces. I know a lot of schools do art shows, things like that, but where they can get sort of more of the greater community involved, I think that that helps for sure. Um, and I think, you know, even when you do things like whether you're doing some kind of a debrief on, you know, a project that you're doing, you actually get the students to write about it. So if you can actually get them on social media, get them on, you know, even if they're writing something that they're handing into you, that you're able to publish online or share it on a school blog or something like that. I think where they're actually starting to communicate themselves, you know, this project was so much more than just, you know, um, you know, building a sculpture. It was really about, you know, my viewpoint on my future or whatever it is, you know. So I think. I think it's giving them that voice, and they have it. They just need to be given that vehicle to, to share it, because I think the students know they they have that they have that knowingness that that what you as arts educators are doing is important to them. Mm -hmm. I I remember early on when I was teaching, I used to do something at the end of uh, many of my projects. I would ask them uh, a couple of questions, really trying to help them think about this and frame it and scaffold their thoughts intentionally. Um, I would say, what sort of artistic knowledge or learning do you think you got from this project? And it would be things like scale and texture and sculpting in the round and how to shade. Then I would also ask them the question, what sort of non-art related skills do, did this project teach you that you think you would uh, relate to the real world? And, and I got to say, that was really tough for kids to think about, and I had to give them like a couple of slow pitch like examples, like you know, dealing with deadlines, working with others. But I, I kind of feel like those sort of artist statements or reflections were really, really powerful at the end. Um, so switching gears just a little bit more because um, you know we've talked about how these skills are, are transferable. Um, 
do you at all, Lisa, ever get blowback or feedback from teachers who say, well, that, that school, that art classroom that, that's really deliberately teaching those sorts of skills is very different than the thing that I grew up in, which was traditional principles and elements and shading. I mean, do you feel like if schools embrace this shift that they would look radically different than what a lot of schools are now? Or is it just framing and contextualizing? Well, I mean, I think I think any school who's willing to make that leap to sort of take their arts programming and add that whole other level of being intentional about the you know the other skills that are being taught are you're setting your students up for a different level of success when they leave, and I think that that's our job as educators and as adults is to do everything we possibly can to be preparing kids for life after school. So I think you know. A straight up art class where there's no discussion about it's where it's all about you know the actual art making process it's nice but I think it's 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 missing something like a deeper level where the kids actually can get you know more skill development out of it and actually through that process have that higher affinity for the arts I think when you actually have that broader viewpoint of you know all the different skills that they can learn you are actually deepening their passion and their love of the art form itself all right very cool yeah those are some good thoughts hey uh, Lisa we also wanted to ask you uh, another question that came from our chat role uh, this was Kristen McCarthy again uh, she wants to know how you would rank these skills sort of the, the hierarchy when we're in the art room so uh, there's four of them here I want you to tell us what, what you think as far as most to least important so creative thinking skills mm -hmm. okay learning about artists and art history art movements Okay, connecting skills to the real world, and then learning technical skills. Okay, which of those do you think uh, sort of rank a little bit higher for you as far as you know order of importance? Uh, I think wow, that's that's a that's a really great question. I know, right? <laughs> it's really hard to choose because they are they are so important. But I would say probably the creative thinking piece is very, very, very key, and I'll tell you why. There was a study that IBM did, I can't remember how many years ago, a few years ago, where they asked CEOs from around the world, what are the key skills that you are looking for in your top employees, your top performers? Yep. And creativity yep. came out on top. So I know that from a business perspective and from what employers are looking for down the road from new from a new workforce they need people who can think outside of the box and be creative so anytime right. within the classroom you can link the creativity that's going on to innovation to the concept of dreaming big that I talk about in my book all those things it's just giving them the opportunity to hone and practice those skills that that are gonna set them apart when they're applying for jobs later because yeah. it's it's very you, you need that because the world is so competitive there's so much outsourcing going on within the world there's so much automation as well that if you're not out of the box you will not succeed so I don't know I mean I they're all really great, but for me, that's probably one of the most important. All right. Good. Very, very well said. All right. So, uh, Lisa, we're just about done here, but uh, before we let you go, we have some lightning round questions for you that we okay. do with all of our guests. So we're just looking for quick questions, quick answers. We've got three of them for you. I'm going to start out here. Okay, of all the jobs you've had, and we know that you do a little bit of everything, okay, of all the art-related jobs you've had, what was the best and what was the worst? Wow. Um, okay, so probably two were the best. Uh, one was uh, many, many years ago, I was a chaperone on a production of Oliver, a professional production of Oliver in Toronto, Canada, and I was responsible for the kids and the cast. So it really, I was basically in charge of them backstage, making sure they were on set, 
like on stage when they were supposed to be. So it was really neat for me to be able to fuse my love of working with kids and being a professional musical theater production. So that was probably one of the greatest. Um, and then, of course, my, my background in, in summer camp and, you know, working in, in camping in the arts. Um, so those are probably my two, two favorites. Um, the least... Um, that's tough because a, a lot of... I, I love all of my arts experiences. Probably oh. the least was... Um, when I worked as an usher when I was probably, like, 19 years old <laughs> um, in a... In a performing arts venue and I think it, when I was not able to be inside and watching the performances I hated it <laughs> because I really did I wanted to be in there you know and actually watching the performances so I think because I was more detached uh, it was probably one of the least favorites yeah <laughs> so is it better to be active than Passive, right? So, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem. Uh, so, Lisa, you've had such an interesting career, um, you know, I, that comes and goes and has high points, low points. Um, can you tell us about one of the toughest decisions you've ever had to make in your career? Wow, that's, uh, that's a good one. Um, sure. I think uh, the toughest decision I had to make was actually shutting down my summer camp. I ran a, a summer camp, uh, an arts-based camp, a day camp. And uh, I had to close it down for, for business reasons. Um, and that sort of was the toughest decision because the programming was phenomenal and what the kids got out of the program was just mind-blowing and they did these performances and showcases and art exhibits and they did leadership training and overnight trips and they did so many things that were fantastic. But from a business viewpoint, it wasn't financially viable in the ways that it should have been and it was a tough decision but it was a blessing at the same time because it really allowed me to up my game in business and marketing and now I do uh, business and marketing coaching for artists and you know I teach a lot of that type of stuff now uh, so it was tough but it was amazing at the same time because what I learned was a whole new set of skills that most artists just don't know about. So, you know, I run a program called Overcoming the Starving Artist Syndrome, which is business and marketing, education for artists. So it was uh, it was worth it, uh, but uh, a tough one for sure. All right, very cool. Uh, and then just one last quick one before we get out of here. Uh, what advice would you give to a new art teacher who's just starting out? What, what would you want to tell them? I would want to tell a new art teacher to number one have fun. I think you know, art making is is fun. It's fun, and I think the more that you show your students uh, that passion from yourself, the more they will latch on to you as an educator. Uh, and I think also you know, be intentional from day one. Be intentional of knowing that what you're teaching has a, such a, a huge value beyond the actual art making techniques themselves uh, and praise your students praise their effort praise the process you know give them a lot of validation kids don't get enough validation at all these days so I would really love to see uh, teachers making sure that they really make it about celebrating the success of their students no matter how small that might be all right. Well, Lisa, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We've really enjoyed uh, having you on. Uh, any last words before uh, uh, we, we get you out of here? Uh, well, I would love to chat further. I love chatting. If anyone you know wants to find me, they can uh, check out the Artistic Edge website, which is theartisticedge.ca. Uh, and please contact me, email me. You know, there's uh, there's so much work to be done in the field of arts education, and uh, I love speaking with with artists and educators. So find me and let's uh, let's keep the conversation going. All right. All right. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, guys. Hey, and just uh, a quick note before Andrew and I break it down. Uh, we'll put all of Lisa's contact information, website, all that stuff in our show notes. So if you check the AOE live page in the write-up uh, in a couple of days here, then we'll have all of that out there for you. Okay, so Andrew, uh, big takeaways from tonight. What are you thinking? 
Oh man, I could have uh, I could have just listened to her talk forever. I mean, there's such so many oh, great right. uh, nuggets there. You know, I think about how we promote our programs, and I think one of the things is, um, you know, we've talked about sometimes people call these soft skills, the creativity, the the critical thought, as being those values that art teaches really well. I love her um, point on how these are really leadership skills. These are how we teach people, students, yep. grown-ups, citizens, to dream big, um, to never give up, to have tenacity, to have confidence, to sell themselves, to market themselves. And I, I never thought of about how well arts uh, do that, and, and that's really fantastic. Um, I, and it goes back to a thought that I've had for a long time that is, you know, that, you know, number one, your art class is not about preparing future artists, in, in my book. You know, everyone benefits from the, the skills, the creativity, the collaboration, the critical thought. So I think that when we as art teachers start to shift a little bit from, you know, having those things be secondary, but really having them be deliberately taught about and discussed and promoted and thought about, we'll really be doing some really great work. Yeah, and I think one of the things that Lisa was talking about uh, that I really appreciated is you have to talk about those things. Like, you can't just let your kids sit there, here's our lesson, you know, be creative with your brainstorming, and then never talk about it again. Like, that that just doesn't work. And, sure. you know, you need to have those discussions. You need to let your your kids not only talk about what they're doing, but, you know, help them to understand what they're doing and sort of how those skills transfer. Right, or, or just, like, hope that um, uh, hope that the kids get it because you were thinking it or, or hope that parents kind of right. know what you were getting at. Like, you've got to be deliberate about it. You know, so I want to talk, another big takeaway for me is that, um, you know, we talk about advocacy and how we promote our program. It can't be something right. that you do once a semester, once a year, um, it's got to be part of something that you just do all the time. And I love some ideas on the chat roll about how we use Twitter, how we use social media, share what the kids are doing, but also share, you know, the good work that the entire school district is doing. And, um, you yeah. know, uh, The Art of Ed has a really great calendar that kind of talks about, like, you know, for this month, this should be just kind of what you do, and this month, this should be what you do. And we'll definitely be including a, a link to that at the end because it's really been... Um, helpful for me to think about what do I do and just have it be part of my everyday life as a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. You should um, actually you should throw a link up for that yeah. on Twitter. You know, if you have the time here. Yeah. Um, and you know, one thing that I kind of wanted to expand on a little bit about what Lisa was saying is, you know, not just advocate from our end, but have the kids do it too. You mm -hmm. know, and with elementary, it's going to be a lot more difficult, obviously. But, you know, once you have your kids in middle school, I have my kids in high school, okay, those kids are on Instagram, they're on Twitter, you know, Facebook's more for us old people, but, you know, they're on the social media. <laughs> and so if we can get them to promote themselves, you know, that's indirectly going to be a program too. So I do a lot of encouraging, you know, uh, like Lisa said, give the kids, you know, that, that reinforcement that they need and tell them, hey, that looks great, you know, you should tweet out a picture of that, or hey, make sure you put that up on Instagram, that's really good work. And kids always get good feedback from their peers. You know, I, my mom told me something a long time ago that has stuck with me quite, you know, forever. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, and sometimes I think Lisa even mentioned this, that uh, as artists, we, we don't want to promote ourselves, or we're a little shy, and, and we think that that's, you know, we're, we're bragging too much. But if we don't stand up and, and talk about all the great things that we're doing, no one else is going to do that. So definitely be that squeaky wheel. But, you know, I, I think one of the things, um, you know, to, to defeat that belief that maybe the arts aren't rigorous, this is first and foremost. you got to have a quality program then. Like, don't, yeah. don't yep. fall into that, uh, that paradigm of being, you know, all foo-foo-y. Like, have a rock star program and then tell the world about it. Yeah, exactly. You can't sit back and do nothing and then yeah. complain. You know, like you got to start with a, a strong program and then you can take it from there. So 
That's cool. All right. So anyway, uh, in closing, let's uh, let's hit up our three big topics one more time. Okay. So first one, uh, why is art the most important class? Okay. We talked about this a lot tonight. It, it's able to develop some skills in students that other classes don't or or even can't do. Okay. So you know, leadership skills can be brought about you know a lot of different ways. Okay. And arts you know, are one of those ways, and we do a lot of good things as far as leadership, okay, but also it expands to creativity, okay, higher order thinking skills, you know, a lot of the things that we teach, problem solving, okay, are, are things that, you know, are specific to, to what we do in the arts, and a lot of those skills transfer to so many different places, but they all start, or can start really strongly, you know, with our own programs. And, and you know, there is this belief among some people that art is not rigorous or it's, you know, irrelevant. Not everyone's going to have a favorable opinion of the arts. And, and that is our job to change it. Because like I said, if we yep. don't do it, who else is going to? That's our job. Exactly. Uh, and then our last, you know, what are some things we as teachers can do to kind of help spread that message? And we've talked a lot about that too tonight, you know, advocate for your program and, you know, get on social media, talk to your district. There's a great discussion going on our chat roll of how people, you know, advocate for their own program. Uh, and there are just so many ideas out there of, of what you can do. Uh, and, you know, just advocacy needs to be part of what you do as part of your program. Like you said, Andrew, you, you start with a strong program and then you take it from there. And, uh, and one other thing, uh, uh, you know, if you guys are part of the AOE mailing list, okay, this week's email had five innovative ways to market your art program. So check that out. And if you're not part of the mailing list, you know, go to theartofed.com and you can sign up for it there. And, and you know, it, it all ties in together. So. Yep. And um, so. Yeah, and, uh, so, so Make sure you check out um, uh, my Twitter feed and Tim's Twitter feed. Um, we'll be posting a couple more links um, after the show, um, ways that you can um, share and promote the good work that your program's doing. Um, you can search the hashtag AOE Live afterwards, um, and we can continue this discussion. Um, and we'll hang out on the chat roll for a few more minutes afterwards to get more in-depth with some people. You know, sometimes it's kind of hard while we're talking to, to read all of those, but uh, we'll be hanging out for a while. Yep. And uh, once we close up shop here, uh, as always, the podcast will be available on the AOE Live page. A little bit later uh, this week, it'll be available for download on iTunes. So you can listen to it on your commute, at home in the evening, or even during your plan time. Uh, I'm Tim Bogatz, and on behalf of Andrew McCormick, thanks for joining us on AOE Live. All right. Goodbye, everybody. See you later. <laughs>